But tonight, we have a treasure here uh, in Pelham McDaniels. And I say this uh, from personal uh, knowledge. Pelham, of course, was a professor at UMKC for a while. Um, also, the greatest moment so far in my career as an amateur historian was to, on September 13th, 2007, be on the same program with Pelham. Um, and, uh, the, it was the 10th anniversary of the gem, and uh, Pelham and uh, Greg Carroll, the head of the Jazz Museum, Delia Gillis, who's a professor at University of Central Missouri, uh, uh, Bill Worley is a professor uh, at UMKC and, and Longview, and uh, Sharon Sanders Brooks, uh, we're all in the same uh, program, and, uh, Greg, uh, uh, and, and uh, Pelham got his picture on the program, uh, the 10th anniversary, and Sharon did, you know, being a politician, and I didn't, but... <laughs> Uh, however, it's still the greatest, but to be on the same program uh, with an actual great professional historian and a great human being, uh, Pelham McDaniels, is just a thrill. Pelham uh, has uh, had a great career. Some of you will, will know about his other career, and I'll just say about that, anything that Pelham uh, tackles, he succeeds at. Um, <laughs> And, uh, uh, but his second career as a historian is what I want to talk a little bit about in, uh, in introducing him. Uh, I got to know Pelham uh, when we were both on the board of the Black Archives. As you know, the, uh, the governor of the great state of Missouri, when he was uh, attorney general, uh, helped us uh, put, put the board back together of the Black Archives. The library was very involved in it. I went on the board, Pelham went on the board. We actually offered the directorship at one point to, uh, to Pelham, and I'm sure he's uh, uh, ha happier in this career, though he would have done such a great job. Um, he has such a great sense of public history, uh, of the importance of, of history, not, not just as a, as a great story, though he tells a great story in this book about Isaac Murphy that he's about to tell us about, um, but, but its impact on our lives and, and, and the impact on the community, the impact on our, all our communities that come together uh, to make a community. Uh, and he's written about that, and he's, he's also walked the walk, giving so much back. Uh, I, I watched him as a professor at UMKC, and his concern for his students, his understanding of, uh, of, of his students, his lending his students and himself uh, to projects like the, uh, like the Black Archives, uh, his concern that his students would un, uh, understand the impact of history on real people's lives and understand the real, uh, uh, the, 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 the uh, the real legacy uh, of uh, historical uh, events. Um, he, he is uh, formerly the faculty curator of African American collections and assistant professor of African American studies at Emory University, uh, where he got his MA and PhD, his BS from uh, uh, Oregon State. Um, uh, he's uh, uh, in, in charge of the uh, Emory's Woodruff uh, Library. Um, he's written uh, and, and talked about black masculinity, um, a biography, uh, uh, the intersection of sports and civil rights, that little reference to his earlier career. Um, and uh, uh, he's working on an, uh, an anthology of essays uh, today. Um, I talked to him a minute ago uh, about the extraordinary uh, uh, coincidence that he's talking about Isaac Murphy uh, tonight, and he'll tell you about this incredible story of the man who may have been the greatest American jockey of the 1870s and 80s into the 90s um, in, in Kentucky. Uh, and, and some of you may know uh, the, our Meet the Past episode uh, where, uh, where I interviewed uh, Tom Bass. Uh, who was the greatest horse trainer in the United States from the 1880s into the 1920s in Missouri. And I wanted to know if Pelham knew. We, we discussed this and we decided Tom Bass must at some point have known uh, uh, Isaac Murphy. Uh, they must have crossed probably in Kansas City in the 18, 1890s. Um, he got a horse from Moberly and there was no horse from Moberly that Tom Bass didn't have something to, to do with. Um, but, it, but it's an extraordinary thing that the stories of these two men, uh, of Isaac Murphy, maybe the greatest jockey uh, in the 1870s, 1880s, uh, and Tom Bass, the greatest horse trainer at the turn of the century and, and on, haven't been better known. These are two of the great men, great sportsmen uh, in American history. Maybe we know why their stories aren't better known, but tonight 
you're going you're gonna to hear one of those stories uh, from a man who is becoming one of our great uh, historians and great public historians and great s s storytellers, Pelham McDaniels. Well, good evening, everyone. That's a lot to live up to, I guess, right? A great historian, public historian, public servant. You should all aspire to do the same. <laughs> um, I am so happy to be back in Kansas City to present this um, finished product to a community that I spent a lot of time in from the early 1990s until uh, 2007 when my family returned. Uh, when I had the position here at the uh, UMKC in the History Department. And so over that time period, I was uh, working 2007 till 2012 when we left, working on this research and trying to get it right. Um, and I think that should be the title of, of my talk tonight, trying to get it right, because history, as we all know, uh, can be interpreted in different ways. Um, we all have different memories of, of the same event, how we recognize it from our position, both inside of it and outside that history, uh, can be interpreted in many ways. But it's how we stitch those facts together and how we uh, can communicate the importance of history uh, that matters the most. So this story, uh, this biography about someone who um, I became uh, enamored with in graduate school, uh, is, is a, it's a project that's not just about a single individual. It's, it's our history. It's a history of the United States, it's a history of race, history of sexuality, history of place, um, politics, of course, play into it, labor. All of this is combined in this, um, in this biography. So I'm gonna try to do three things tonight, and I'm gonna try to combine the different ways in which I've presented Murphy in different environments. So I have this kind of an academic kind of preface, a talk. I have the PowerPoint presentation, and then I'm going to read uh, from, from the book. And I'm gonna try to do that within an hour and, and leave some time, uh, Henry shaking his head. I'm gonna try to do it in 42 minutes, okay? So let me start with uh, this introduction with a bit of a paper, and then we'll get right to the PowerPoint. The process of life writing is an attempt at understanding what the subject of the long, arduous task of researching and writing was really like. In essence, the people they were outside the gaze of an adoring public and the self-possessed critical establishment. Ultimately, the goal of the biographer is to reveal the universe within which their subjects lived, succeeded, loved, loathed, and died. All of this with the intent of understanding the choices made and the converging set of circumstances they were challenged to overcome and succeed under. Moreover, biographers are concerned with the interconnectedness uh, that their subjects share with others who were an integral part of their lives, who can be located within their subjects' particular moments of self-discovery and their impact on certain outcomes and situations. In the end, a biographer's job is to reveal the true character of their hero, warts and all. Each life lends itself to an infinity of interpretations bound by the facts. The use of biography as a record of a life within the context of history can be seen as a departure from the more traditional forms of historical writing as a genre in which practitioners use many different methodological approaches drawn from various disciplines, biography requires the biographer to investigate and thoroughly mine the resources available, i.e. institutional records, archives, and special collections, um, repositories, personal archives, and some otherwise obscure uh, sources. I mean, you could find a ton of information in attics, in basements, in crawl spaces, behind wallpaper, in mattresses, it's everywhere. However, those facts still require a quasi-story-like shape to make them decipherable and readable. Arnold Rampersad, the biographer of Ralph Ellison, Jackie Robinson, and Langston Hughes, writes that, and I quote, biography may affect elitist manners, but its business is essentially democratic. It is a leveler. It introduces the great to people who are little, 
the little people, by comparison, and who are curious not so much about the other people's art as about other people's business." End quote. In truth, the aim of the biographer is to create a marketable facsimile of a life to a public wanting to know who someone really was. The role of the biographer, therefore, is to compose a whole out of parts, and in some instances, shards of evidence, to clearly define what the subject of his or her inquiry was like in terms compelling enough to hold the attention of their audience. So who wants to read a boring book, in other words? Um, yet biography is much more than piecing together of literal facts about the life of a, a single human being. Biography, or life writing, is an art form that is not only grounded in facts, but is wholly informed by the commitment to capture a clear view of an individual, the complexity of their life, and an understanding of the world in which they lived as completely and objectively as possible. To that end, biographical writing has value beyond the mundane and ordinary representations of people's lives found in popular culture. It is through the lens of biography, or life writing, that we are afforded the opportunity to explore the past as it relates to issues of race, class, gender, sexuality, labor. Through biography, we can discern the kinds of choices individuals made within the context of everyday life experiences. Some good, some bad, and some unimaginable. In the case of Isaac Burns Murphy, very few have attempted to write about his life in terms related to the intersections of race, class, and gender within the context of reconstruction in late 19th century identity politics. Moreover, those who have explored his life often fail to understand the complexity of African American life and history, especially during the 1890s, uh, to be able to fully appreciate the circumstances surrounding his rise, his success, and the maintenance of his position uh, in America. So I want to pause for a minute here. So those of you who pay attention to this type of history, when I say pay attention, it's easy to forget the past because we're kind of mired down in the present. But the 1890s uh, in American history is, it represents a really dark time. You know, we, we have uh, Jim Crow legislation, of course, being incorporated into everyday life. But as it relates to lynchings, there are on average 150 lynchings in the South during this time period, in that every decade, 150 lynchings uh, throughout the decade of the 90s, I'm sorry, each year. Um, and so this time period is significant in that this is the same time period that black jockeys are disappearing from racetracks and black baseball players are disappearing from teams that they had played on uh, as integrated leagues and, and organizations. So there's, there's something going on in America at this moment in history that, uh, is effect, that affects Murphy's opportunities and other jockeys and other African American men especially that we have to recognize and understand. At best, uh, most uh, who do research uh, on biography, uh, who've worked on Murphy, uh, reiterate the success of Murphy and his still untouched winning rate of 44%. Unfortunately, arguments have been made and positions have been taken, um, and uh, many of them to disparage Murphy's legacy. For example, uh, through the various channels people learn uh, from, from uh, for example, when through various channels people learn that I was working on this biography, questions related to Murphy's success as a jockey, his reported alcoholism, and the mythic sums of money he earned in the saddle, as well as loss in his struggle with the so-called temptations black athletes have thrust in front of them, I found myself a bit troubled because the evidence that I uncovered revealed someone whose life was more complex and intentional than had previously been understood. Yet I waited patiently to complete this book before discussing uh, what I found buried in the annals of history. While no previously published book length biography of Murphy exists, um, there's one book by Betty Boris, which is a compilation of his win-loss record and some information about um, his, uh, his world, the world he lived in, but it's, it's not exhaustive. It's very thin um, for biography. And the, the few journals uh, and book chapters and web entries that you probably Google and see it on Wikipedia or whatever, um, they recycle the same information. So no one really did the research. No one dug through the thousands of articles and, and uh, documents that were available. They just recycled the information, uh, which is, of course, problematic. Um, very much so. 
Uh, in, re in researching, analyzing, and writing about Murphy's life and career, I'm often disturbed by the lack of due diligence accompanying the criticism of his character by researchers and lay historians, most of whom did not consult the thousands of documents, books, and archives uh, begging to be utilized in the quest for answers uh, to questions about his, his masculinity and his character. Uh, through the available evidence, it remains apparent that Murphy's character, above all things, it was, uh, it's, it was what made him unique in an occupation that was, by all accounts, a haven for gambling, vice, and um, excess. In the July 5th, 1890 edition of the New York Age, the editor, T. Thomas Fortune, wrote glowingly about Murphy and his wife, Lucy, as examples of African-American success. And I quote, Mr. Murphy has a fine home in Lexington, Kentucky. He neither gambles nor drinks nor associates with the tough characters who follow the same business as he does. Mrs. Murphy accompanies her husband in all his rounds of racing of the racing season, and no spectator watches with more breathless interest than she does when her husband is up. When the event is over, the terrible anxiety is past. When the flyers dash under the wire, those who know her say that she wipes the tears from her eyes and heaves a sigh of unutterable relief." End quote. In Fortune's accounting of Murphy's measurable success and character, he provides a glimpse of the jockey and his wife that most are not aware of. The extent to which Murphy constantly demonstrated his gentlemanly decorum, his Victorian values, and his manly restraint should at once be recognized as the fulcrum by which to challenge stereotypical assumptions related to 19th century notions of African American manhood and masculinity. In late August 1890, after near tragedy at Monmouth Park, whereby uh, Murphy was almost killed and was accused of being drunk in the saddle atop Ben Ali Hagen's forensic, he swore in an affidavit that he had not been drinking but was drugged or poisoned. Newspapers across the country, including the Cleveland Gazette and the New York Age, supported an inquiry into the incident, arguing that Murphy, quote, has been suspended pending an investigation. We hope that it will result in his being honorably acquitted and the punishment of the scoundrel who committed the crime, for we believe Murphy was drugged. He has written too many years and handled too many leading horses to be guilty of such a blunder, end quote. Unfortunately, other newspapers, including the New York Times, the Times-Picayune, and the Chicago Horseman, pursued the more damning explanation of the drama that unfolded at the track that day. In the New York Times, it was reported that Murphy had overindulged in champagne, a habit which has in the past gotten the better of him, but never to lead to quite such a sad exhibition of himself as he made at the track yesterday. The fact that he was acquitted by the jockey club and was allowed to return to racing, unfortunately did not prevent his critics from continuing to attack him in the press or certain owners from denying him the opportunity to guide their horses around the track to victory. At the beginning of the era of Jim Crow legislation, white Americans and newly arrived European immigrants convulsed at the prospect of black success. Most saw the rising numbers of African-American middle-class individuals as a challenge to white opportunities for prosperity and power. In the Northeast, the horse racing establishment and white jockeys sought to destroy black jockeys. Within, uh, while in the West, thoroughbred owners wanted to maintain their ability to compete for high stakes offered at the racetracks in New York. The stage had been set for sports ousting of the men and boys who had made horse racing both popular and lucrative. In the end, the astute Murphy maintained his composure and gentlemanly decorum, but his career was over and his death soon followed. So that's kind of the framework of uh, thinking about the book because the details um, you know, describe why uh, Virginia, uh, Virginians moved west into Kentucky, into that different land, who they brought with them to clear the land and to set up these barns and these farms, um, cultivate the fields for hemp, corn, tobacco, and the, the consequences, both unintended and intended, of having these particular people, the human chattel that did this work, 
became the jockeys, trainers, and grooms. These are the men and boys who develop horse racing um, in, during the 19th century. Murphy is but one story, and he was born in 1861, so he wasn't there at the beginning of this movement into the West. He was born at the beginning of the Civil War. Cued up. So <clears throat> when we talk about the book, I break it into three different segments, Roots, Rise, and Redemption. The roots, as it relates to Murphy, uh, goes back to this idea of how slavery comes about. What are the factors that created this you know, um, time in American history that we mustn't forget? At the same time, I was also interested in understanding how the black Lexington uh, community responded to these pressures, both the enslaved and the free. Uh, the root section also establishes uh, Murphy's, um, both his uh, maternal and paternal lineage in Kentucky. So we understand that potentially his grandfather was a white man who was involved in horse racing, who owned a saloon. Uh, his his uh, grandmother was an enslaved woman named uh, Ann Murphy who worked as a, um, a, um, a domestic in one of the townhouses in Lexington. His mother, by the name, uh, by the way, her name was America, was uh, born in Lexington and uh, cared for her son um, uh, post-Civil War. And his father, Jerry Skillman, uh, also went by Jerry Burns, was born on a farm outside of Lexington and worked in the hemp industry. And I'll get some of those slides. But again, the roots are very important. And uh, this actually, you know, I, I broke the, the book up in these different segments because, you know, when thinking about you know, following our own, looking at our own history, our personal history, right? If we follow the roots, we, we can figure out where, we, where, our, where our lives begin. But the process of entangling those roots, that becomes really meticulous and very important for us to understand the consequences. Uh, horse racing in Kentucky uh, began, especially breeding, as early as 1803. Uh, and the horses that were bred in Kentucky were sold back to some of the Virginians and uh, folks from South Carolina and North Carolina. And, and anyone who knows the history of horse race will understand that it was about the development of a particular breed that would be American. And an American breed would be a horse that could travel for four to six miles without having to stop for water or food. So early on, if you recall your history about horse racing, the challenge uh, was in these four mile match races. Two horses would be matched up, they would run, it would be a rubber match basically, the best two out of three. And that breed that could run those races and win consistently would, would be, able, be able to get the stud fees. And those horses would be bred then to travel into the West. So horse racing as an industry was important as it relates to maintaining pedigree so we can actually develop an American breed of horse. But again, the men who were developing these horses, most were in Virginia and Kentucky. There were some of course in Nashville and Tennessee uh, proper but Kentucky became that location. Again, the Civil War begins. And you have people here like um, Elijah Mars, who uh, escapes from his uh, plantation, from his farm near Louisville, and runs away and joins the, Civil, joins the Union Army. Um, and that was one of these uh, stories that I think in Kentucky is very important because, you know, Kentucky provided the black soldiers mostly. I mean, Louisiana had the number, but Kentucky was second. Kentucky had a number of uh, these, these black men who ran away and, and joined up where they could camp uh, Fort Nelson. Uh, camp Nelson, rather, was one of the locations they ran off to. Um, when we're talking about evidence, Isaac Murphy, again, looking at different accounts, obituaries, uh, when he died in 1896, uh, most say that he was uh, born on the Henry Tanner Farm. The only evidence I found of a baby boy being born was a ledger. And this is births and deaths on his farm, and also a ledger of goods purchased um, and, and goods owned. And so, because there were no birth certificates for slave, enslaved children being born during this time period, you have to look in places like ledgers, property ledgers for, for children, especially you know, looking for Isaac Murphy. And so I found this ledger um, related to what David Tanner owned. And uh, again, as close as we're gonna get is something like this to account for his birth. 
Again, his father's name was Jerry Skillman, but he changed it to Burns later on. Uh, he was part of the 114th Colored Infantry out of Fort Nelson, out of, rather Camp Nelson. Um, the 114th, 15th, and 16th joined up with the other units in um, Virginia and St. Petersburg and formed the 25th Corps. Um, and again, I think Crosby hit on it that this book is so dense that if someone was interested in writing about the experiences of black soldiers, I mean, there are several out there. James McPherson's written several books on Negro soldiers in the, in the uh, Civil War. Uh, you know, um, there, there, again, there's several. The 25th Corps is, there is a history here that needs to be understood. At the end of the Civil War, the soldiers from Kentucky were basically all gathered up and sent to the Rio Grande. Um, they were sent on a ship, a steamship, uh, with half rations. A number of them died from scurvy. Uh, they stayed there for two years, some three, before they were mustered out. Um, and the, uh, the thesis is that they were a, a threat to changing the balance in Kentucky. So if you release these soldiers from their duties early on, they were gonna go back, full strength, back to Kentucky and challenge their former owners and masters for power. So by sending them to the Rio Grande, you actually thin their numbers out, and you kind of took the steam out of their hats. So it's another history I think needs to be explored. Camp Nelson is very important to this uh, story of especially in thinking about black Lexingtonians and, and those that are in this region of um, Fayette County. Um, during the uh, beginning of the war, uh, Camp, uh, Fort Camp Nelson was built, built by um, enslaved black men, enslaved men and women, but they were used to build this, um, uh, the, 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 uh, the barracks, they were used in the stalls, uh, the men were used, of course, in the stables, the women were used as laundresses, um, they worked as cooks. But what ended up happening was that when the husbands went off to join up, the families followed. And when the families followed, Camp Nelson became a haven for these communities, for this particular community. And uh, eventually, they basically kicked the women and children out of Camp Nelson in the winter. And, um, and it, was a, it was a news report in the New York Age. Uh, several, of course, died, and that became big news. Uh, and the soldiers actually were up in arms that their families were dead on the road and they're trying to serve um, you know, the cause of freedom and this is what happens uh, to their families. Uh, the, the black community in Lexington during Reconstruction is, is very, very interesting. Um, before the American Missionary Association, before the Freedmen's Bureau comes into Lexington, um, you have uh, Bell Mitchell here, Bell Mitchell Jackson later on, and um, John Monroe, and this is the Colored Fair Association. They create the schools in Lexington, the schools that Isaac Murphy would attend and other young black uh, boys and girls. They also create the Colored Fair Association, which provides opportunities for farmers to sell their wares, for coopers to sell their wares, um, and the, the Colored Fair Association comes out of a conversation in 1869 in Louisville at a convention where John Mercer and uh, Frederick Douglass attended and inspired the crowd to actually go out and develop the skill sets and tools needed to claim freedom for their own. Education was one, business was the other, and get to know what the law in, entitled them to. And so uh, members of the Colored Fair Association attended that meeting in Louisville and came back and established this institution, which went on through the 1930s. So from 1869 to 1930s. Uh, 1874, um, Isaac is apprenticed off to Richard Owings and J.T. Williams. Now, I've got to give you a, a really quick background about this. So, America Murphy establishes an account with the Freedmen's Bank. She also purchases property in Lexington, one of the first black women to do so, and one of the first women probably to own property in this particular uh, section of, of, of Kentucky. Um, through friends, through family, she gets deeds to property, she sells property, she accumulates this nice bank account. The Freedmen's Bank fails, she loses everything property included. Uh, by this time, 1870, she is now, uh, uh, has tuberculosis consumption. Isaac Murphy, uh, again, thinking about your history, uh, what happens uh, to orphans usually? 
You have an idea? Workhouses um, with vagrancy laws that are being incorporated into some of these southern states, he could be arrested and put in prison and work in a hemp house. So what she does, being as smart as she is, she works for Richard Owens, who is a partner with Owens and Williams uh, race, Racetrack and Stable, uh, Stable and Horse, horse Barns. And uh, she asks uh, Mr. Owens to take her son as an apprentice. Lucky for her, a good friend of their families, Eli Jordan, is one of their head trainers. Eli Jordan takes Isaac under his wing. Um, Isaac starts training, and so in 18, um, 74, he begins his apprenticeship. The first horse that he rides or mounts, the name is Volcano, and Volcano erupted. And young Isaac, of course, hit the ground and didn't want to get back on there. But apparently, Eli Jordan convinced them that this is the only way to go. You need to do this because your mother can't really take care of you. Murphy's rise is, is uh, it's very quick. And it's, I, I believe, in, in doing my research, um, his rise is very quick because he's smart. In the 1870 census, if you look at the sheet of maybe 20, 25 people, Isaac and his mother, America, are the only ones who can read and write. And so he's not just a quick study, he understands the concept of pace, he understands you know, how to feel a horse, he's, he's astute in, in, in so many ways. And, and again, he is, um, he's a mystery, I think, to most, and still to me in some ways, because I'm always looking for his verse, voice. So I'm looking for Murphy. Uh, this image comes out of Harper's, and so uh, the depiction of black jockeys and trainers uh, consistently during this time period, um, outside of some of the beautiful curionized lithographs, were these uneducated, gambling, shuffling type of individuals, when in fact, uh, there are other images of them represented very nobly by painters like Edward Troy, who was a 19th century artist. But these images were circulated more heavily in 1883, 1884, 1883, Isaac places an ad in the newspaper. The first time I'd seen a jockey place an ad in the newspaper for his services. He also marries uh, Lucy, who is from Frankfort, Kentucky. Um, I believe they met at Frankfort, uh, in Frankfort at Fleetwood Farms, uh, the owner of um, um, Blue Eyes and a number of these horses that were winners at Saratoga and, and uh, Louisville. But, uh, he begins his career as this prodigy almost because people in the, in the media respect him. Uh, again, he has the, um, the intelligence to place an ad in the newspaper for his services. And it only lasts a week before he has his, all of his dates filled. So they knew the quality of jockey based on his reputation. In 1883, he would also receive a contract from one of Kansas City's uh, citizens at the time, Ed Corrigan. You all probably have heard of the Corrigan building downtown here, or Bernard Corrigan, or even Patrick Corrigan, uh, men responsible for building the streets, the roads here. I mean, they, they, they imported and, and poured granite and, and you know, made the roads. Well, Ed Corrigan had made a lot of money traveling out west, building the railroads between uh, Denver and Utah on the, the Oregon line. And, um, made a lot of money gambling on horses, and you know, Crosby mentioned, mentioned um, Tom Bass. Uh, so Corrigan, basically listening to the stories told about him, was into gambling and racing horses, and he met with the Mormon gambler who beat him every time. And he had some of his men come out to Missouri, go to Moberly, Missouri, to find him one of the fastest horses that they can find. And he said he brought a horse back from Moberly, and he said he beat the Mormons so bad he made them Christians. <laughs> And so these are some of the men and women that Isaac raced for, the owners. And I thought this was very important because you have a chance to see the range of individuals that he surrounded himself with. Uh, E.J. Baldwin, Lucky Baldwin, sort of Santa Anita, that's out in Del Mar, California, um, becomes very important to Murphy as well. Uh, offers Murphy the, one of the first $10,000 contracts for first ride, for first call. And what that means is that if he wants him to ride at the Kentucky Derby, he's gonna ride the Derby. But all the other races, he can pick up $100 here and there from other people who want him to race. Uh, Meta um, Hunt Reynolds, the wife of J.W. Hunt Reynolds, um, she would become important later on. Her husband dies in 1879 of a, a brain aneurysm uh, visiting family in North Carolina. She takes over the F Fleetwood Farms and becomes the first woman who has a horse in the Kentucky Derby. People don't know about that. 
She is the owner of Fleetwood Farms. Her name could not appear in the program, but she has a horse in the race. Um, JW was the son, the grandson of um, John Wesley Hunt, who was the first millionaire west of the Allegheny Mountains. Uh, his business was in hemp and cotton tobacco. Why is hemp important? Not, not, no, wait a minute, let me make sure, I, let me say this. <laughs> oh, thank you, okay. Not just rope, not just rope. During the, uh, that's pretty good. Um, prior to the Civil War and a little bit afterwards, uh, hemp was also used as bagging. So you were made this hemp bagging for cotton and the twine that wrapped that, those hemp uh, uh, tons of, of cotton, and then the rope was used to secure the hemp bales to ships. So hemp in Kentucky and Missouri, Missouri is more or less local. Uh, my colleague Diane Moody Burke talked about local production of, of these types of commodities. But in Kentucky, hemp was very important because it, it was connected to the southern cotton trade and southern, southern, uh, southern, southern agricultural um, uh, commodification of materials. Um, James Ali Ben Hagen, James Ben Ali Hagen, I'm sorry, uh, another important uh, owner, he owned horses Forenzi and Salvatore, the famous Salvatore that won the race that we'll talk about later. He also gave Murphy great opportunities to earn large sums of monies. We're talking again, you know, at one point he was making $25,000 in a season, and you have to multiply that times 25, or actually by, is it 75, 75. Um, last but not least, Ed Corrigan. Uh, apparently Ed Corrigan was really kind of a mean man. He enjoyed his money. He wasn't much of a drinker, but I, can't, I, guess, I guess he could cuss you really, really um, badly. I guess I can say that. But he was a hard man. But again, he gave um, Isaac one of his first opportunities in 1883. Lucy Murphy. This image of Lucy um, I found in the um, papers of T.T. Wendell. T.T. Wendell was a physician in Kentucky, and he lived near the Murphys, um, but this was after Mur Isaac Murphy dies. She's still in the house on Third Street. Why this picture was in that uh, collection, I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, he didn't treat her. She had a different doctor, but this is the only evidence we have of Lucy Murphy, you know, this beautiful image of her. Um, uh, her death record, she dies in 1910. The story goes that uh, the, the will, in his will, he leaves her everything and all debts are paid and there's about $30,000 left, so she still has a nice sum of money. But she takes a carriage and takes flowers to his grave on occasions, um, when, on the occasion that they die, and that exhausts all the money because she's so committed to, to her love, right? Um, and um, she dies um, working as a domestic in a home in Lexington. And of course, Isaac Murphy. Um, so this title, An Elegant Specimen of Manhood, this was, I, I found this was really what intrigued me. Because here you have this man uh, during the 19th century, a black man who, I mean, look at that face. Um, he was in some ways, uh, it was, people were attracted to him. So in the pages of the Spirit of the Times, I'll, I'll read from here. Uh, Walter Vosborough wrote dotingly about Isaac, calling him the quintessential jockey and gentleman, an elegant specimen of manhood to be recognized and applauded for his example in the saddle and out. The 23-year-old, whose life must have felt somewhat unreal and unfamiliar, continued to blossom. He had become the toast of horse, horse owners, fans of the turf, and an adoring colored public from one coast of the country to the other. He commanded a salary that rivaled that of businessmen, lawyers, politicians, and educators, yet he remained modest and humble. Isaac certainly could not have imagined the changes uh, the future would hold. And so, you know, he is such a compelling individual. And here in the 1880s, 1887, 1888, um, before you had bubblegum trading cards, you had tobacco cards. Well, Murphy appears on six, um, and I don't find the same number for white jockeys. So and you'll find some of Ed Corrigan, you'll find James McLaughlin, you'll find um, you know, images of some of the other jockeys, but Murphy appears on more. So his popularity is really high, which is important to what I, what, basically what I'm going to show you later. Um, here is an advertisement here, uh, famous runners and jockeys, and here's Murphy. And here's Isaac Lewis. 
some of the famous horses that were of the age. And here you find his rivals, Ed Garrison, um, and even the colors, you'll see some of the horses. This is um, Ed Corrigan's colors right here. Friends and rivals. Um, these black jockeys, Anthony Hamilton, Willie Sims, William Walker, these two traveled overseas when it got really bad in the United States. Willie Sims was the first American jockey to win an American horse in a British uh, horse match, in a, in a British race. Anthony Hamilton uh, went to Italy in 1904 and where he died of influenza, uh, but they left the country because it became so hard for them to ride in the United States. William Walker was a peer of Isaac Murphy's in Lexington. Uh, Murphy was actually, uh, uh, Walker was actually married at the Murphy's home uh, in 1887, I believe. Uh, Ed Corrigan, one of the major rivals, uh, the rivals that he had, and James McLaughlin. James McLaughlin is interesting because he wasn't as, uh, it wasn't as an intense rivalry with Ed Garrison. He was, he had class. I say he had class because Ed Corrigan, in some quotes, would dismiss Murphy as a, as a showman, a show-off. Whereas McLaughlin said, the man rode to win. Um, so in 1890, and this is an important picture for you to see. In 1890, this match race at Monmouth Park uh, was one of these races that uh, I told you earlier about the, the four mile races and the best two out of three. Well, this match race at Monmouth Park in 1890 between Tenney and Salvatore was important for a number of reasons, not because of the amount of money being bet, not because of the rivalry between uh, Garrison and Murphy, but other things, again, the 1890s represents this, this time period in American history where, um, where, where black men especially were being denied not only their uh, citizenship, but their humanity. And so these types of head-to-head -head competitions, a number of things can be taken away from them. Not just the opportunity to win um, large sums of money, but to prove oneself in the, in the court of public opinion about one's value. So the contest unfolded in a black man versus white man, black society versus white society. The outcome would determine the opportunities for the future or the challenges ahead. So this is how it was read in the media. But what I want you to understand about this picture as well is that this is the first recorded photo finish in sports history. Wow. How about that? And if you look closely, Murphy is standing, sitting straight up in the saddle. Yeah. Garrison is hunched over. So he's riding almost in English style. Here's another depiction of that same race. And of course, he's not English style here, and he's on the, on the outside, he's not near the rail. So I said earlier about Isaac Murphy's, um, him being represented as this elegant specimen of manhood, and, and the, the beauty of those photographs of, of him, chiseled face, and really kind of a humble demeanor. <clears throat> the 1890s, you'll see late 80s, early 90s, you'll see now these, these caricatures, these grotesque representations of blackness um, promoted in postcards. Um, and this uh, Spaven's um, medicinal kind of ointments for horses. And then just on, you know, things from the races that uh, you could send to, to your friends and family to, to show them that you were at the race. And so what, I've, what I'm finding is that the 1890s, through depictions of these black jockeys, start to unravel the history the history that we know to be true, that, that these men were, in, were and boys were at the, the center of horse racing, now they are being more or less represented as um, 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 comic relief. At the end of Murphy's life, uh, after his last race in 1895, he only has one race and he wins it. Uh, he goes into vaudevillian types of performances. In fact, one of them was here in Kansas City at the Ninth Street Opera House. He was in a play entitled The Derby Winner. And The Derby Winner, winner was written by Al Spink, who was the founder of the Sporting News. I don't know if you all knew that, uh, St. Louis. 
Um, and it says right here, in early June 1894, Isaac was offered a chance to participate in the stage production of the Derby winner, which featured a cast of 42 actors and six real racehorses, including the retired Friedland. Friedland was owned by Ed Corrigan. Written by Al Spink of the Sporting News, the play was performed in October in Midwestern cities such as Omaha and Lincoln, Nebraska, and St. Louis and Kansas City, Missouri. Among the many reviewers was writer Willa Cather. Um, and, and says, uh, she was critical of the play, she was so critical of the play that she would not publish the names of the actors for fear it would ruin, ruin their future opportunities. Uh, the play was that bad, apparently. Um, but Murphy, you know, again, he had money. Why he did this, I'm not sure. I think he was coaxed out of his home to actually participate in something public like this. One of the final images we have of him over here, he's on horseback um, with his fence line right here in the back. Um, and of course, uh, a year later, 1896, he dies at home of complications that were similar to pneumonia. Um, and uh, it's at that, that point of his death where we start to lose him. And we start to lose this history primarily because um, people forget where he's buried. Um, black jockeys are now being banned from the, the racetracks. And this history kind of slips into the cracks. So my work on Murphy uh, has been very important for a number of reasons. One, to account for you know, this tremendous amount of history that, that we, we all share. Uh, at the same time, it's to set up um, a 20th century understanding of the impact of black athletes on America. So if we understand that during the 19th century, especially around horse racing, that these men and boys are at the core of the development of the sport, um, what happens in the, in the 20th century around sports like football and baseball and basketball? Um, what is the impact? Is it uh, based on this kind of racial, uh, racialized understanding of one's worth? Uh, is it based on class opportunities? What is it, what is it about? And so um, the Murphy Project is, is still evolving. Uh, I'm working on Anthony Hamilton next, and I think that's going to be revealing as well. How much time do I have, Henry? 10 minutes, okay. Uh, so to close, I would like to read uh, from the final chapter of the book. Uh, it's entitled, The Pageantry of Woe. On the morning of Sunday, February 16th, 1896, a veil of dread descended on the stylish two-story red brick Victorian home at 419 East 3rd Street in Lexington, Kentucky. Four days prior in the liminal hours between night and day, Lucy Murphy wept as her husband, Isaac Burns Murphy, the famed jockey and hero of the turf, struggled to take his last breath and then died. He had been sick for more than two weeks with a flu-like illness, but the possibility of death had not been entertained, at least not publicly. The overcast February morning was not unusual for this time of year. The cool, crisp air was characteristic of central Kentucky winters. Yet on this particular morning, the grayness of the day lent to the sullen mood. The funeral notices had gone out the day after his death, informing select friends and family that the services would begin at three o'clock at the Murphy residence. As expected, a dozen or so acquaintances arrived early to help ensure that all went as planned. The Reverend Spencer P. Young of Lexington's First Baptist Church would lead the services, followed by a selection of songs by the Lexington Choral Club. Time permitting, those closest to the family would offer condolences. The body would then be escorted by a procession of the Lincoln and Sardis Lodge of colored masons in the Bethany Commandery of the Knights Templar to African Cemetery Number no. 2, the final resting place for thousands of former slaves and free blacks from the Lexington area. One of the early arrivals was a 15-year-old white girl named Nanny Atchison. Prior to Murphy's death, Nanny had visited the home on numerous occasions to buy milk, butter, and eggs from Lucy's sister, Susan Osborne. In 1893, Nanny's father, William Atchison, had moved the family to their new home, a one-story wood frame house at 398 Third Street, not far from the Murphys. Nanny had been raised around horses and horse racing. Her father worked for Murphy at the Lexington racetrack that backed up to the Murphys' 10-acre lot. 
and she sometimes went along to watch. She knew that of Isaac's importance as a jockey and had listened to her father and the other men defend him when he was accused of being drunk in 1890 at Monmouth Park. She had heard the rumor that he had been drugged because of his unwillingness to throw races and the speculation that he had become a target of powerful white men in the East. Isaac's success on the Oval Track had been the pride of Lexington. He would say, and I quote, I am as proud of my calling as I am of my record, and I believe my life will be recorded a success, though the reputation I enjoy was earned in the stable and in the saddle. It is a great honor to be classed as one of America's greatest jockeys, end quote. His three Kentucky Derby victories in 1884, 1890, and 1891 and hundreds of wins in Nashville, Louisville, St. Louis, Chicago, Saratoga, and New York made fans and enthusiasts of the turf rich and brought positive attention to the thriving horse industry, which employed thousands from central Kentucky. Like royalty, the Murphys moved in and out of various social circles, befriending influential black and white doctors, lawyers, and business owners from one coast to the other. Many recalled the Murphy's home in Lexington as the scene of lively parties and joyous celebrations. As a popular hero to many, Isaac Murphy worked to balance his responsibilities as a community leader, husband, and the most successful jockey of his generation. He was a conduit between the black community and the powerful white elite of Lexington. Nanny entered the Murphy home where the air was thick with the perfume of the floral arrangements, wreaths, and bouquets of exotic flowers sent by Murphy's friends and contemporaries. In the parlor next to the casket was a large display of lilies of the valley sent by three of the owners Murphy had written for, Ed Corrigan, L.P. Tarleton, and Ed Brown. These gestures of condolence, remembrance, and appreciation were touching to say the least. Also in attendance were the great black jockeys, Anthony Hamilton and James Soup Perkins, who had benefited greatly from their friendship with Murphy. Hamilton was a personal friend, and Perkins, the winner of two Kentucky Derbies, had learned how to judge the pace of a horse from Murphy. Isaac frequently discussed his racing philosophy with anyone who showed an interest in his approach to riding and to life. To Nanny Atchison, and the hundreds of mourners lining up in the cold to pay their respects, Murphy was a paragon of virtue. She ventured into the parlor to view Murphy's small, lifeless body, dressed in black and the traditional white gloves and apron of a mason. He was resting in a beautiful copper casket covered in purple crushed velvet with silver trimmings, a replica of President Ulysses S. Grant's coffin. Nanny would remember Isaac as a nice, neatly dressed, very clean and very pleasant person with a gentle disposition. The mood throughout Lexington was heavy with sorrow, reminiscent of the passing of a great leader. Thank you. So I guess I'll take questions now. Yes. Yes. Why do you change the name from his father's name? To his grandfather's. <clears throat> well, based on, again, the evidence I, I could find, um, it was a way to honor his grandfather. And so his grandfather had been in horses, and again, I'm, I'm you know, using the evidence available to say that his grandfather had owned the stable in Lexington, and um, America was raised around horses, and his grandfather had identified him as a potential jockey. So to honor his grandfather, uh, he changed his name. Yes. 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 So <clears throat> I spent a lot of time at the, um, the uh, Sporting Library Museum in Middleburg, Virginia, uh, and also at Keeneland Library in uh, Lexington, at the M.I. King Library, at the University of Kentucky, the Kentucky Historical Society, the Filson Society, um, the uh, Lexington Public Library. Uh, here I found a couple of items of Murphy related to Waldo Park, which was a, a racetrack here in the 1880s uh, that was located between 71st and 75th homes and prospect. Um, so I, and all over, Chicago has materials. Um, I'll, I'll share a quick story, <clears throat> but 
So part, part, of, um, part of my work and, and really my, my, the development of my um, methodology comes out of my, my training uh, in American studies and interdisciplinary kind of research models. So one day I was watching a, um, a show with my kids, Nova Science Now, and it was this one particular show about black holes and th the theoretical physics, right? Why are black holes out there? Well, you know, there are many explanations. But the one that really um, appealed to me uh, was this idea that, you know, we can't see black holes because they, they don't reflect light. They, they tear apart every, anything that comes in, in close to it. But we can see the effect that black holes have on the things around it. So not saying that Murphy's a black hole, but see Murphy as that gravitational force changing the uh, environment around him and trying to understand who he is by the people who surround him. So I started looking at the trainers, um, I started looking at the other jockeys, I started looking at racetracks, and when I looked directly at those particular individuals, I found Murphy somewhere in the margins. They would say something like, the famous colored jockey Ike Murphy, or the famous you know, uh, Lexington um, you know, jockey Isaac. And so, and then you'd look through the race records and see, oh, there he is, because he changes his name, uh, 1877, I believe, to uh, uh, Murphy from Burns. Uh, he rides under Burns and then he changes it very quickly. Uh, but you, you have to, I had to look at this, had a different approach to understanding where to find the evidence, because it was, if you look straight on, you couldn't find much. I mean, there, there are the interviews, I found those documents, you know, the, the funeral notice and the death certificates, things like that. But looking for his voice, I had to look in a different direction, and I found him when I looked at these different people, like E.J. Baldwin. I found that he traveled out to California, uh, came through Kansas City again on his way to California, you know, uh, trained out to San Francisco, took a boat from San Francisco to Mercer, and then took another train to E.J. Baldwin's uh, property out in Arcadia. Yes. Yes. Uh, you mentioned that uh, at his funeral or in however it is there. Yes. The Masons celebrated him. Uh, it, has anything been done, uh, works been completed or investigated, the relationship of black athletes and the Masons during the 18 uh, 70s and 90s. No, that's, I think that's, that's, that would be really good, interesting research because that would assume that athletes were middle class or were part of a particular group uh, of, of men in the community. They were leaders. And so Murphy was a secretary. He was the keeper of values. And so again, looking you know, in the periphery, I found uh, W.H. Ballard, who was a Mason. And in his book, you know, book I, I found, you see Murphy listed, Isaac Murphy, keeper, you know, secretary, and that was something that had never been found before. And, and again, uh, researchers not necessarily interested in the narrative, but interested in the horse, in the racing, and making assumptions about his, his life uh, very narrowly. Yes, and Green. Uh, Helen, you, you mentioned this in your, in your presentation, but some jockeys are great at rating horses, some mm -hmm. of them just have an instinct for the flow of a race, some yeah. of them just have a, a knack of picking a good mouth. Yes. What, what was his particular skill set that made him so outstanding and that made him a Hall of Fame job? I think of him as a chess master. You know, he knew who he was against, not just the horse, but the other jockey. He knew Ed, uh, I, um, Ed Garrison would beat his horses. He would whip the horses. But he also knew what his horse could do. So you'll find it's, in some races, he would take a horse out really slow, trying to get the inside rail. Other times, he'd, he would wait. It was a waiting race. He understood that another horse is going to get out soon. It's going to quit. It's going to sulk when, it, when another horse gets in front of it. And so he anticipated this. And I, I think this is what made him so brilliant. He, he could win by a nose, but the fact of the matter is he won. He could win by six lengths. The fact of the matter is he won. And so I think his intellect really shaped the outcome of races because he knew what you were going to do before you did on a turn, on a wet track, on a dry track. You know, what a horse could do on an empty stomach, on a full stomach at 2 o'clock as opposed to 10 o'clock. I think he studied and understood all the different details. Um, it's kind of like NASCAR, I guess. You know? <laughs> yes, sir. Um, I've tried to, in the last year, many years, to understand the reaction of Nazis and the German nation to the Jews. 
And today there seems to be two theories. One, there's something inherent in the national character of Germans. Another, Chris Brown of Carolina says it's just circumstances. Mm -hmm. In your study mm -hmm. of the racism that developed against blacks in America, yes. do you have any theories as to why it became dominant the way it did? I'm going to let you read my book. <laughs> One more question. Because that question leads the book out. I mean, that begins the book. The first chapter sets the, the pace for you to understand how and why black jockeys get excluded from horse racing when they were at the center of the development. I think, when you, and, and, you know, really quick, thinking about the 1790 Naturalization Act, I'll put that out there for you because that allows for immigrants to come in and claim whiteness, therefore claim power. One more question, I have to mix it up. <laughs> yes, ma'am, I thought, no. Yes, ma'am. Did they have any children? They did not have any children. They did not have any children. The, uh, the relatives that I've been able to find, um, America Murphy had a brother named James and a sister named Anne, and they moved away to Covington, um, uh, Covington, Kentucky, around the same time uh, Isaac became a, was apprenticed off. Uh, and I, I think, if, if I remember correctly, that Anne's family, her children, ended up moving to Nebraska. So I'm, I'm trying to find you know, these, these pieces, because I'm, I'm imagining that you know, we all have had family members who've passed away, and there's stuff in their homes, and nobody wants it. Nobody knows what to do with it. And so if family members are coming to the funeral, and, and Lucy, of course, is probably not there. She's you know, her husband, her, her love of her life is dead and what to do, you know, Susan's helping her, but other family members are going to try to assist. They don't know what to do with the stuff, who's taking it, who's keeping it. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm almost in my mind imagining, and I'll, Henry, I'm about to stop, Henry, um, but images like this, he probably owned some of these. You know, he's in them. And so I can imagine that they may have hung in his parley or, or in his library. Uh, where are they? So, um, thank you. are answered in the book, which is for sale. <laughs> <laughs>